Hey everyone and welcome back. I'm Mike Wade. Thank you for tuning in to Dissect and Connect, a podcast where we explore population health issues impacting your community. This podcast is a service of Montgomery County Prevention Partners and New River Valley Community Services. Our podcast is made possible by a grant from Carilion Clinic. The views expressed in this program may not reflect those of Carilion Clinic. Gail Maddox-Taylor is the Director of the Office of Behavioral Health Wellness for the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. In this role, Gail provides leadership in the development and implementation of comprehensive substance use disorder prevention systems at the state and community levels, including efforts to address opioids and overdose. She also oversees Virginia's initiatives in both suicide prevention and mental health first aid, as well as the state's Adverse Childhood Experiences Initiative and Behavioral Health Disparities, including the Virginia Refugee Healing Partnership. In addition, Gail is the National Association of Substance Abuse Directors National Prevention Network Representative for Virginia. She currently serves as first Vice President for External Affairs and represents the National Prevention Network Organization on the Society for Prevention Research Board, a member of the Executive Board, the Research and Evaluation Committee, and co-chair of the Workforce Development Committee. Gail is also an advisory committee member for Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. So, Gail, welcome to the Dissect and Connect podcast. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. So, I don't think we can record a conversation in the spring of 2020 without acknowledging the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, the question that I'm asking of all of our podcast guests recently is, how have you personally been impacted by the pandemic? Personally impacted um, by the pandemic. And once again, I agree that you really can't talk about spring 2020 without talking about it. Personally, I have a friend who lives several blocks away from me. Both of her aunts passed away within a week of being exposed to the virus. Oh, my goodness. So that really hit home in terms of um, how easily it can be caught Mm -hmm. and how quickly it can have devastating results. So as a result of that, I've taken it very seriously in terms of social distancing, sure. uh, as well as making sure, taking the proper precautions with a mask, as well as um, the other CDC guidelines in terms of hand washing mm-hmm. and making sure I keep the cabinets in my, my household clean, et cetera, making sure my husband comes in and washes his hands, so we're, we're taking it very seriously. I don't know how you can at this point. Right, exactly, yeah. and I'm hoping that you're doing the same. Absolutely. Because um, it happens so quickly, and another friend of mine, fortunately, she has recovered for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't know where she picked it up. She's recovered for the most part, but right now she's having some lung issues, um, and she's been out of the hospital for two weeks, and so now something else is resurfacing. And she did not have any pre-existing conditions. Oh, wow. So, like I said, we've got to take this thing seriously. Absolutely. Well, hey, we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit more um, later in the interview. But um, for those who may be listening that don't quite understand the concept of behavioral health wellness, I was hoping maybe you, t- you could take a minute or two to explain that. Okay. Behavioral health wellness is the old term used to be prevention Mm -hmm. and specifically more substance use or substance abuse prevention. But people really did not understand the concept of prevention. They understand it in the physical health capacity in terms of preventing heart disease, preventing diabetes and other physical illnesses. Mm -hmm. But it has been a difficult challenge getting people to understand prevention of substance use disorder, prevention of mental illness. So therefore, we we decided to take on a different spin in terms of branding it into behavioral health wellness because folks embrace the concept of being mentally well, of being substance use or abuse free. Mm -hmm. So therefore, behavioral health wellness has been able to take a foothold when we couldn't get a foothold as it relates to prevention. 
because I don't think anyone can dispute the value of being well. And right. when we use the word prevention, folks would always say, how do you know uh, with prevention that anything worked if anything didn't occur? And that was my point exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. All of our efforts to reduce risk factors for substance use disorder or for mental illness work because it did not occur or the problem did not occur. But going back to um, talking about behavioral health wellness has been much easier to get people to understand because who doesn't want to be well? Who right. doesn't want to be healthy? Both not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. So we're excited about the new brand. So um, I wonder if you could give me just kind of a general assessment of the state of behavioral health wellness in the Commonwealth of Virginia as we speak. As we speak, I dare say behavioral health wellness is being challenged because of being um, up in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And one of the key risk factors for substance misuse and suicide, mental illness, depression, anxiety is social isolation. So right now, as it relates to behavioral health and wellness, we're really being challenged. But this is when our prevention workforce, our, our behavioral health wellness workforce, can come into full force, full action. They've had to be creative and nimble in how this happens. But increasing social engagement has been critical during, the, during this time mm -hmm. in order to prevent folks um, from feeling as isolated. They really need to know what to do in order to decrease the consequences of social isolation. Mm -hmm. So we're challenged right now, but we are stepping up to the plate and being very creative in terms of how we work. And, and I'm glad you brought up the point of isolation because really even before the pandemic came into our lives, um, the issue around isolation was really a severe problem that kind of went under the radar for our, our uh -huh. society. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Because unfortunately, we see a rise in suicide, a, a rise in substance use disorder amongst our elderly, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, they are quite isolated. We've been, become so busy in our day-to-day -day lives that oftentimes we forget the seniors of our community. Right. And as a result, they become more and more isolated. And then families have become isolated from one another. And as a result, this increases the risk for a lot of problem behaviors as well as becoming emotionally and mentally unwell. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're really concerned about the recovery community because of the fact that social isolation does not bode well with them being able to practice their recovery because much of their recovery is based on social capital, based on being socially engaged in positive atmospheres, substance-free atmospheres. Currently, we've seen a lot of relapse going on, and mm -hmm. even though the re recovery is not um, my main focus, but it is a part of our partnership, and we are just working hard to make sure that the recovery community um, is exposed to opportunities not to be as socially isolated. Right. And whenever a community services board or, co or a community coalition has a podcast or a Facebook Live, it's open to anybody who mm -hmm. may be feeling that sense of isolation. Yeah. So... I'm sure that you've also seen the uh, most recent data from VDH around um, unintentional drug overdose. In the first quarter, we've already seen a pretty significant increase across the state in that uh, category. Yes, we have. And one area that's really alarming to us is the fact that a lot of those overdoses are in the 15 to 25-year-old mm -hmm. category. And we know that 15 to 25-year-old um, population Social engagement and interaction is critical to the way they live their daily lives. So we're sure that this is particularly challenging mm -hmm. with that age group. So therefore, strategies need to be directly targeting them in order to decrease that social isolation. Because going back to that's linked to substance use disorder and overdoses, it's linked to suicide. I saw some data yesterday as it relates to we see an escalation in the suicide text line right. that 
it's been they've been escalating exponentially mm-hmm. and we do know that that age group particularly will reach out to text um, when they are considering or contemplating suicide right. more so than picking up a phone call so we dare say um, that those things are pretty linked so we really have to start doing some targeted efforts with that po- with that age group yeah I've got uh, two of my own who fit in the, to that age group and uh Text is definitely their preferred method of communication. Right, exactly. And I've got, well, mine are older. Mine are, are 33 and 31. Mm-hmm. But once again, if I really want something or <laughs> if something's urgent, it's better for me to text them to get a response as opposed <laughs> to getting a phone call. Because nine times out of ten, I'll probably go to voicemail. And, you know, they're working and everything, so I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about COVID-19 and how it's impacted prevention and behavioral health wellness. But um, prior to the pandemic, um, what in your um, years of experience has been the biggest, has had the biggest impact on prevention work and behavioral health wellness, both good and bad? Um, The good thing about prevention work is the fact that because our resources are so slim, Mm-hmm. And because of federal requirements for us to only do evidence-based programs, practices, and strategies, we really had to hone in on what works, what's effective, and what's not effective because of the limited resources. We want to make sure that we spend our resources well. Right. And as a result of that, particularly in Virginia, we've been able to create systems that are based on data that are based on evidence-based practice, that are based on linking our strategies to the data that comes from our communities to actually do things that will be effective in our communities. So that's really exciting. And we've gotten a lot of reports as of late from um, our evaluation teams here in the state Mm -hmm. to show that what we're doing is making an impact. So that's something that's really great for the field of prevention, heightening our visibility as um, a vocation, Mm -hmm. as a career has been very valuable Um, amongst the community services boards and in the communities. Our work with coalitions and in the communities has gotten a lot of heightened visibility, which is wonderful because we just recently did a Virginia Behavioral Health Needs Assessment. And across the board, the executive director said that if it weren't for prevention, they aren't sure how recognized the community services boards would be in the communities and their ability to link people to services. So that's a great thing. Yeah. That's a phenomenal thing. The challenge, the biggest challenge, is that prevention is still so misunderstood. Mm-hmm. In our state, we're more of a reactive state as opposed to a proactive state. Right. So many more resources are given to treatment and recovery than they are to prevention. A very concrete example, Virginia is one of right now five states that get zero dollars for substance use disorder prevention. All of the states get money from their state. To give another concrete example, the state of Washington, they have 40 prevention staff at their state office because of all of the investment in prevention by their general assembly, by their, their state office. In Virginia, we have 10 prevention staff because we don't have the resources to fully build out our prevention um, team at the state office. Also, we don't have the resources to really fully build out the prevention teams that are in our community services boards. Generally, they operate between one and four people on their prevention teams when Mm -hmm. communities require more. Communities need more. And this is when you have maybe one prevention staff, but let's say over 25 clinical staff. So Virginia has more of a let's treat the problem as opposed to prevent the problem type of philosophy. And that has been a huge challenge in making that paradigm shift and linking it to funding. So yeah. that's a big challenge that we're having. And we've been fortunate here in the New River Valley that our, our leadership within RCSB has always seen prevention as a key component of that continuum of care, that it, it's a natural fit. And if we're doing things well on that end, then later on, obviously, 
hopefully it mitigates some of the issues that folks see um, in treatment. Exactly. And if New River Alley could talk to some of their um, colleagues with that same philosophy, because I do say people get it, they yeah. understand it, but going back to just trying to get folks to invest in it, because I dare say somewhere inside of all, know, all of us, we know that prevention works, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. We know that, yep. all right? But operationalizing that in our staffing patterns and in our budgets has been challenging in the vast majority of community services boards. So I dare say it's exciting that New River Valley is ahead of the game as it relates to seeing the value and then putting the money where the values are Mm -hmm. is is huge kudos. So that's really good to hear. Well, maybe some of those other um, agencies are listening. (laughs) <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope so. No, because once again, you know, in our needs assessment, it demonstrated that they understand the value of it. Yeah. Um, but it's just giving us the validation mm-hmm. through more resources, exactly. you know, would yeah. be very helpful. Because then, because when I think about how um, the millions of dollars that are allocated to treatment, and then zero dollars allocated to prevention from general fund dollars. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty alarming. Mm-hmm. So. so let's switch gears a little bit. Why did you choose this as a career? Well, um, many many years ago, I was a juvenile probation officer, mm-hmm. and I had five kids murdered in one summer. Oh wow! And all of it was related to substance use. This order or really basically selling drugs right. back then right. and I will never forget one of the kids I had on proba- probation he um, told me he said well I'm doing it because I'm not going to live past the age of 25 wow. so I might as well make sure I make my money now and there was such a sense of hopelessness yeah. that I felt like we have got to get in on the front end mm-hmm. which is why I started looking more at the prevention path mm-hmm. And as I look back at it and start to understand adverse childhood experiences more as um, as a factor in the young people back then making the choices, it's just like, okay, prevention is where to go. That's where we need to get our investment. So to the shorty 40s of the world in my <laughs> early career, it's like this is in dedication to them. So that many young people um, that have grown up in the environment that they, that he and the other kids that were killed on my caseload, Mm -hmm. as well as to the parents who did the best that they could, knowing what they had, the resources that they had, and realizing how social determinants of health really help create pathways forward for people. Mm -hmm. All of those things that I look back are really influencing the way um, we do our work here in the state and the practices that we are trying to replicate across the state to really make a difference in people's lives and their their wellness. That might have been a little bit more information than you wanted, but that really helped shape why I decided to take the prevention path. No, I'm really glad that you shared that. I uh, I had not heard that story, um, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so since you've jumped into the world of prevention, how's the work changed? How's it evolved over the t- over time? Um, primarily, okay, from when I started back, we focused primarily on programs mm-hmm. and individuals. So remember back with the with the Dare program yep. and. Um, the philosophies of just say no. Right. One of the things that's really changed, and I alluded to it earlier, is that what we do has got to be evidence based. It's got to demonstrate outcomes. Early on, we did what felt good and we thought what was working, but now we use data in order to identify the problem. And early on, we looked at individual kids, working with individual kids and really putting the burden of their behavior on them as opposed to just looking at their um, environment Mm -hmm. and seeing the influence on their environment, to see the influence of schools, to see the influence of their parents and how they were shaping these young kids and individuals. So what has really happened, um, there have been many paradigm shifts 
first of all, we've gone from focusing just on individual kids to services across the lifespan as it relates to prevention. And we used to say wound to tomb services right. because we look at the fact that anyone can be at risk or have risk factors in their lives and in their communities and in their schools and their families that will influence whether they will have problem behaviors. So going from focusing just on kids to going to wound to tomb, from using the research as it relates to what risk factors really create problem behaviors and what protective factors need to be in place. So starting to use the science as it relates to what is most effective, multiple strategies across multiple domains. And those domains being the individual, the family, the school, the environment, um, and the community. So, and that's a part of the science, all of the Hawkins and Catalano social development theory and risk and protective factor theory. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the research and science as it relates to the institutes of medicine and realizing that there's some strategies that we use that are for everybody. But then we have to look at your universal strategies. And then we have to start looking at high-risk groups, um, which is, are the selective fact, um, strategies. And then the indicated strategies, looking at uh, indicated populations. And then I know um, a lot of practitioners are, you know, kind of reluctant to start looking at the data. But I think we've done a huge paradigm shift in Virginia mm -hmm. to know that instead of doing what feels good, you've got to have the data You've got to use the strategic prevention framework, right. and we call it the SPIF, mm -hmm. to see what the data is telling you about the communities that you live in and what are the risk factors based on data that you need to look at that are creating the environments within your community. So taking the science and having the science really shape our practice has been a huge paradigm shift because that's the only way you're going to get outcomes if you look at the science, know the data, and know how to measure the change after you've implemented evidence-based, not just programs, and I want to emphasize that, right. because prevention was, de was um, defined by doing programs, like programs in a classroom or a, or a parenting program, but prevention has expanded quite a bit. Behavioral health wellness has expanded quite a bit to look at strategies that are impactful, strategies that not only reduce substance use disorder, but also promote mental health and wellness, preventing depression and anxiety. The shared risk factors for those um, behavioral health areas. Additionally, looking at strategies such as coalition development, knowing that we have to work with our community coalitions because our community coalitions bring everybody to the table mm -hmm. so that everybody has a voice and everybody has a role in the community in addressing the problem. Because substance use disorder, mental illness, is a community issue that requires a community response. And then also looking at the different strategies, such as environmental approaches, Historically, like I said, prevention looked at programs, but mm -hmm. we know that if a policy changes in a community, like not allowing kids to purchase tobacco at your local convenience store, right. we know that that impacts more than that just teaching the kids about the dangers of tobacco in a classroom, but it also prohibits them from being able to purchase tobacco in a convenience store, not just tobacco, but alcohol. Mm -hmm. And our next major feat would be addressing marijuana as we get closer and closer to some legalization issues with that. But we're going to work on it for sure. We could uh, do an entire podcast episode just on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is the truth. A lot of work has got to be done in that yeah. space. Yeah. So. But prevention's up to the challenge. We always are. We always are. Gail, I'm curious to hear what you think about the um, the current state of stigma toward uh, mental health and substance use disorders. I want to believe that with the advent of social media and technology that we've been able to um, address some of that and, and maybe make things a little easier for people to open up and share. Absolutely. And that is 
not unique to Virginia. Mm -hmm. Mental illness has borne the consequence of stigma for a long time. Way back in the day, instead of identifying that Uncle George had a problem with depression, you know, the language that was put around Uncle George's behavior as they made sure he stayed in the back room and not interacting with folks, those things have gone through generations. So therefore, we are making a huge effort to reduce the stigma through our mental health first aid, teaching people about mental illness, how they're just as prevalent as physical illness, Mm -hmm. and that every family is impacted by mental illness, whether it's a substance use disorder, whether it's depression, anxiety. We know that depression and anxiety impact 20% of our population. Mm -hmm. And these are people that we live with. These are people that we work with. So working hard to reduce that stigma so that folks will feel comfortable talking about it, sharing with others, and show that recovery is possible that you can live in your family as well as work and live in your community without experiencing as many consequences as it relates to your mental illness. So we have trained almost 69,000 Virginia community members in mental health first aid to help reduce the stigma as well as it heightens their awareness But just like when you teach one person, that person is going to go out and talk to other people and have influence on their in their sphere of influence. So we're hoping that by doing mental health first aid across the Commonwealth, that we will be able to reduce stigma. And our CSBs and our regional coalitions are instrumental in reducing that stigma. And as members of the New River Valley community are trained in mental health first aid, that will help change the norms within that New River Valley community as it relates to stigma, people feeling more comfortable talking about their own mental illness, and also people reaching out for help when they've learned the signs and symptoms of mental illness and um, having a support system to help get them connected to the right resources. So I'm a little bit passionate, very passionate (laughs) about stigma reduction in terms of um, mental illness and also as it relates to substance use disorder, because there are many people who we know have a problem with drinking um, and or other substances. And if one thing has come from the opioid epidemic has been realizing by the realization by many more people that it is a substance use disorder. It is an illness. So that has heightened with reducing the stigma mm-hmm. of substance use disorder. So it's good to know that there's some positive consequences with some negative ones. So Absolutely. that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, let's just go back to uh, COVID-19 quickly. Uh, I want you to maybe look in your crystal ball and Um, talk about what you anticipate to be the long-term implications of the pandemic as it relates to behavioral health. As it relates to behavioral health, I think there's going to be some positive consequences, and but there's going to be some negative ones. So we'll start with the negative one. Mm -hmm. I dare say that the the social isolation will create a whole generation of people who are experiencing depression and anxiety for the very first time at the level that they're experiencing it. I think that there's going to be some heightened substance misuse Mm -hmm. and lead into a level of dependency that may or may not have been there before. There will be some many, the many people that have been, you know, successful in their recovery, but they're experiencing relapse as it relates to whether it's substance use disorder and or um, mental health disorders. Additionally, there's going to be a new generation of kids that are experiencing adverse childhood experiences, Mm -hmm. um, known as ACEs, because they may be in an environment that are not healthy for them to be in, and that school provided an escape. Now they have no escape. And additionally, uh, with that, 
living in a pandemic is very different and can really impact a child. Also, we know that domestic violence is escalating and um, exposure to that, not only by the children in that household, but also by the victims of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So with all those negative consequences, I I dare say there's some positive um, consequences that have come out of COVID. The ability to use telehealth as opposed to utilizing the the face-to-face in my office type um, therapeutic intervention. Mm -hmm. I think we've expanded to really see that, okay, there've got to be more methods or more ways of reaching people because I already know for a fact that um, I've heard some reports that people, some folks are, are more comfortable with telehealth and having their session via telehealth as opposed to coming into the office for face-to-face. More folks are reaching out in some areas mm-hmm. um, because it, because of the comfort level. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for behavioral health wellness in order to reduce the impact of those risks that have been presented with ACEs, with providing um, more accessibility to folks when they're knowing the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety, and behavioral health wellness being able to provide resources, i.e. through our mental health first aid, so that people can get linked to services. The fact that because we are so community-based, based, we've had to become much more nimble in the use of um, social technology in order to, and creating methods of media, social media, in order to create community engagement as opposed to everybody always meeting in a room. Right. Um, I dare say it's that social connection physically is really, really important. I'm still an advocate of that. However, we've got more tools in our toolbox now exactly. to heighten community engagement. Yeah. Um, the creativity at its finest that we will not lose. So I dare say we have gotten so many more tools in our toolbox to help move our, our profession forward. Yeah, I think that's absolutely I think true. I that's upon us positive. Yeah. And I, can, I just need to add one more. I think this period of social isolation has given people an opportunity to really do some resetting for them personally, as well as for communities to do some resetting to see what's important, uh, because you've had some time to stop and think yep. what's valued to you. We've had the opportunity to see communities rally together to make sure people are fed. We've seen communities rally together to make sure parents have their what they need in order to cope with the new homeschooling mm-hmm. that they have to do. With their, with their own children, a greater appreciation for teachers that are out there um, and the work that they do. So all of these help contribute to positive and healthy behavioral health and wellness, um, being able to empathize with many folks that we have taken for granted. Um, so, yeah, there's some positive consequences out there. Well, and I'm I'm glad that you you went the positive route there to um, to wrap it up. I I totally agree with you, and and I say it a lot, but I truly believe that it, it does take a village. Yes, absolutely. So, Gail, any parting words of wisdom or one takeaway that you could share with our listeners before we uh, wrap up our conversation? Um, just to say that this will not last forever. That I'm hoping that people have had the opportunity to learn something and. In terms of how important it is to practice self-care, to keep those social connections going through COVID-19, through remote access, to take care of yourself, get out and take a walk, um, walk with your kids, get fresh air, because all those things help to contribute to building healthy relationships with your family, building healthy um, outcomes for yourself as a result to exercise and as an alternative to substance misuse, um, as well as the ability to still thrive with all the limitations and that you can still control some things. So lean towards wellness and optimism because we will come through this healthier people. It's a great way to wrap it up. Um, if 
folks want to learn more about you or more about um, DBHDS, um, Office of what, Behavioral Health Wellness, how would they find out more about that? Basically, um, they can either email me, which you probably have. Well, I'm sure you have all my email information. Yeah. Go to our website. Unfortunately, it's being revamped right now. Okay. But we do have a Facebook page for the Office of Behavioral Health Wellness um, that Marco Barnett is keeping up. To me, especially during this time. So feel free to connect that way as well. Yeah, and we'll be sure to include that in the uh, show notes for today's episode. Perfect, perfect. And Mike, I can't thank you enough for asking me to participate in this because behavioral health wellness, this is a time for us to really activate. Yeah. So. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time and look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, sounds good. My pleasure. Take good care of yourself. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Dissect and Connect. For more information about Montgomery County Prevention Partners or New River Valley Community Services, be sure to check us out on Facebook, or visit nrvcs.org.